Uh, with this uh, console, you will uh, be able to have a, a comprehensive view of your entire secured environment, uh, along with real-time insights into how BlueShift is identifying and blocking cyber adversaries attempting to gain access to your IT infrastructure. Um, as many of you know, I'm sure there's a lot of technology and a lot of people working very hard here every day at BlueShift to make sure that your infrastructure and your data remain secure. But up until now, um, you've not really been able to see that information for yourself. So today we're going to, uh, to debut this new future, uh, feature for you. It will provide you with those real-time insights. So you can log in and see what our technology is doing and see what our, uh, our managed SOC is doing for you as well. Uh, here's just a brief agenda. Um, Dave Wolf of Blue Shift Cybersecurity is going to just give you a brief overview of the console and then actually demo it for you. Uh, then we'll have some time for some Q&A. So if you have any questions about the console uh, while Dave is talking, um, just please put those into the chat and then uh, he'll be able to answer those after his demo is concluded. Um, after Dave, uh, we're very excited to be joined by Tom Repoy from Sygen Technology. Uh, Sygen is uh, one of Blue Shift's partners and they are, are a world leader in uh, data security. So via your agreement with Blue Shift, uh, you do have the opportunity to include some of Sygen's technology into your uh, Blue Shift subscription. And Tom Recoy can go over the ins and outs of all that for you. He'll provide us with an overview of Sygen and then um, also provide us a demo uh, so you can see Sygen in act action. And I'm sure uh, you'll be uh, very impressed with all the technology that Sygen has to offer. Um, after the demo, Tom will be more than happy to answer some questions. So again, as Tom is talking, please put your questions into the chat and uh, we'll feed those to Tom afterwards. Um, so Dave, uh, with any further ado, I'll pass this over to you. I can uh, keep sharing my screen, Dave, until you want to um, share the, the, dem uh, the, the demo itself. Great. Thanks, Rob. Hi, everybody. Don't worry, there's only uh, three slides here just to level set on uh, this uh, new capability that we're going to be demo or I'll be demonstrating shortly here uh, by way of uh, uh, what we're calling the management console. So it's primarily focused on uh, users like yourselves, either MSPs or customers, and it's meant to kind of provide a visibility into what it is uh, the value that you're getting out of the Blue Shift uh, service. So. Uh, it gives uh, high-level summary metrics uh, that include things like uh, the threats uh, that have been blocked, uh, you know, what endpoint, how many endpoints are under management, uh, usage, license, and uh, newly added uh, uh, metrics that are uh, we're adding every day uh, to this. And I'll be showing you some around uh, the vulnerability. Uh, counts and risk scores, and we're continually adding to the list of available data that you'd be able to get access to. Uh, it's not for forensic purposes, uh, so this there's really no uh, drilling down into details, and that's intentional per uh, the the way that uh, Blue Shift CTO Greg wants. Uh, this to work, so there's no data in here that could be used uh, in any way. Uh, you know, maliciously, uh, it's relatively high level information. And again, it's just meant to give a constant contact. If you're an MSP and you want to uh, be, you know, constantly letting your customers know uh, what uh, this solution is doing for them on a regular basis and know what they're paying for, you can do that. And as a customer, you can do the same and sign into it and see, uh, you know, the continually updated set of information that's coming in in uh, near real time. Uh, as to how uh, uh, what the Blue Shift offering is is doing for you in your case. Uh, next slide, Rob. Okay, so just as a very high level features, it's it's really essentially a uh, reporting mechanism uh, that it's meant to give you a very easy access to these high level sets of metrics that we I talked about earlier. Uh, it is customizable per, for each individual user, and we call it active because uh, the data is continually flowing in, so it, it does uh, update on a regular basis as well. Uh, so I'll, I'll be demonstrating uh, the customizability that you have there on the dashboard uh, 
by way of the primary feature. So as we continue to add new uh, widgets, we call them, containing new data sets, you'll uh, see them appear on your dashboard and you have the ability to uh, you know, customize uh, the end result. And that remains with you between sign-ins uh, as well. For uh, when you're looking at it from an MSP's perspective, uh, if you're managing multiple customers, you actually get to not, uh, you know, filter is, uh, one way to think about it, but you're really putting yourself, you can put yourself in context or look at a single user or customer's uh, perspective and even set up and configure reporting uh, for them in and have those emails shipped out or have those reports sent out to them. But the idea is that you can you be actually become what the tenant would see if they were to log in, the customer would see when they log in. This gives you the ability to add additional users if you want their, that customer to be able to log in uh, to get to, to view their data, uh, you can add new users that uh, whether they be uh, there's a couple of different roles in there, just a read only user and uh, someone who can also uh, create or generate reports on, on their own. It is uh, localized into a number of different languages that's based on your browser. So if uh, for those in uh, uh, around the globe, this uh, will continue to add to the to the list of uh, available languages. This was the, the starting point that we had now. Uh, you do have the ability as an MSP to add secondary or as many administrators as you want. So you'll be given a primary access to one person and then additional users can be created for or you can go in and create additional administrators that can have the equal or equivalent capabilities that you were given initially. And of course, the whole the whole point of this is around the reporting, really being able to go in and generate a report. Uh, we have canned reports out of the box, and we're going to continue to grow that list of reports that you can then set up and configure uh, to be run on a regular basis and uh, e either be emailed out uh, automatically, or they can uh, the the reports themselves will just be. Uh, executed and stored in a PDF format that you can go back and view at any time. And uh, the this by, just by way of note, uh, we've done our best to make this also mobile friendly. So although um, you know the primary interface would likely be a, a desktop or a laptop with a browser, it should work fairly well on smaller devices as well. It's uh, uh, rendered. Uh, using mechanisms that allow it to, to scale to those different uh, formats. All right, next slide, Rob. Okay, and so just uh, as I kind of alluded to earlier, there's this hierarchy that's implicit in, uh, in the system. And you know, depending upon who you are, uh, whether you're an end customer or you're an MSP or the BlueShift uh, admins themselves, uh, you you fall in these different categories. So in this case, uh, MSP one is managing or has three customers, and they'll be able to see uh, the data in an aggregate or at an individual customer level within the dashboard, depending upon how they uh, change their view within there. Uh, now, just by note, all of the setup of the uh, whether it be for an MSP or a customer or the or the sensors, the devices that are uh, part of a customer's deployment is all set up and created or managed by the BlueShift administrators. You don't have to do anything. As a new customer comes online, you will just automatically see them uh, appear underneath uh, your list of available customers uh, when when uh, they get set up and configured and the devices are sent out uh, by way of a customer, direct customer, or uh, as you get added, you will uh, you'll be able to access or sign in and again automatically see um, the data coming in for your uh, for your environment, the uh, things that have been. Uh, the devices that have been deployed there, you'll be able to see what they are. And you'll, whether you're an MSP or a customer, you can actually uh, decorate or make small uh, data modifications to some of these uh, objects that you'll see uh, in here. So specifically things like uh, a tenant uh, a device rather, uh, you know, give you the ability to uh, put, say, some more details about where the location of that device is. I mean, if you have more than one uh, sensor in your environment, you may want to say this is in data center one, rack two, or something like that. So we do give the ability to customize that, uh, as well as customer information as well. If you're an MSP, you can decorate 
um, customers that are already set up underneath you uh, for uh, with additional contact information and uh, at location information as well. Okay, so I think that's probably it. Um, I think we're all here to see this uh, new dashboard. So let me go ahead and share. Uh, are you seeing my dashboard, Rob? Yep. Yes. Okay. 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 So uh, let me just uh, sign out here real quick. So you see, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign in as Kevin to start off with. Kevin works uh, for a company called Security Call, which is an uh, an MSP who has uh, a couple of customers that uh, uh, he's responsible for or he manages. Uh, when you log into the dashboard, it automatically sets up a date range of a couple of weeks uh, that we're looking at here. So things that are uh, trend or aggregated uh, in here uh, would initially show as the two weeks time frame, but you can change that date range uh, very easily at the top as, as you wish. Um, so again, I won't go through all of the details because you'll be able to come in here and it's pretty pretty straightforward, but we try to give you an overview of you know, the activity that's been happening. Um, and again, my default view as an MSP is to look at things across all of my organizations. So these numbers are aggregated, the number of agents and protected devices, the vulnerabilities of the blocked attacks, malicious connection, um, et cetera, are all aggregate for all of my customers underneath here. Uh, recently added, if you've uh, if we've given you kind of a preview of this pre, uh, before, and uh, uh, you know we had a limited set of widgets we've added to to recently, which includes these uh, vulnerabilities uh, counts are are new to here, and the customer the risk scores uh, the risk scores that show here are basically uh, be a before and uh, pre and post having the XDR in place and. Uh, you know, we can go into more details or we can, uh, we can get Greg to go into more details on how, how these are calculated, but it's essentially giving you an understanding of uh, the currently for, because in a customer view, it doesn't make sense to, or in a multi-customer view, it doesn't make sense to aggregate or, you know, average these numbers together. That really doesn't do you any good. So I'll show you how this switches when you put yourself in context or when a customer signs, signs in. So uh, you get to see uh, the, the current or latest uh, vulnerability counts across those two, the customer uh, risks, uh, the SOC alert trend. So anything that we call a trend here is really just plotting that uh, graph over time and including uh, the vulnerabilities that we talked about and a breakdown of um, you know, critical high, medium, and low. These are somewhat active, so you can uh, change the, you know, what, uh, if there's multiple plots like this on, on a graph, you do have the ability to change or to customize those. And as well as all the sensors, uh, in this case, uh, you know, the top sensors by SOC Alert, since we only have a couple in here for the demonstration, uh, there's only, you know, uh, two, two showing here. <clears throat> this is uh, fully customizable as to what it is that I want to see. So if I wanted to take away, uh, say, the blocked attacks on here, you'll notice that the dashboard will change and refresh. And this will be my, I'm signed in as Kevin now, and this would be my view that's persistent across sign-ins. So these sign-ins, um, you know, this persists uh, across uh, each time it's stored, your preferences are stored in the, in the repository. Uh, so no matter where you sign in, this will uh, look and uh, feel the same. If I uh, change the date range, obviously this would change, uh, you know, a little bit about the data as I go through um, and refresh, let's see, um, here as well. So this is a fully dynamic uh, display. And if you happen to want to capture this information right here as it is uh, for posterity purposes or for sharing, you can also generate a PDF with the information that's being displayed on here. So uh, this instantly created a PDF uh, for me um, and uh, gives me the ability then to kind of save that attached to an email or, or what have you send send it out if I if I wish so you can uh, you don't have to kind of screen capture or, or save this in any way you just click on click on the PDF 
Now, I mentioned one of the features of this, uh, and I'll show you what it looks like when you sign in as a customer as well, if, you, if you're a customer or if you're interested in what, the, what they would see. But if, uh, if Kevin switches to the, the view of BiggieCo, this is actually, he's now not just filtering, but Kevin is actually in context of BiggieCo, uh, meaning that things that he sees and he does uh, are exactly what the uh, someone that signs in from BiggieCo would see and what they would be able to do uh, within here. A couple of things changed on the dashboard when I did that. Primarily, the risk scores now show as these uh, dials uh, get, uh, widgets because now I'm in context of a single customer. So it makes sense to kind of show uh, a little more drill down. And I can also see how the risk or the how the scores are changing over, over a period of time that I have uh, up in the display up here. Uh, so am I trending up or down uh, you know, from a risk perspective, um, from a vulnerability perspective down below? I can uh, see that as well. So again, I'm looking at things just as if uh, um, someone were to sign in to it. Speaking of users and sign-ins, as the MSP or BlueShift can give access to a single customer by adding a user here and gives me the ability to say whether they're read-only or not, which basically means can they run uh, or reports that I'll show you in, in a second in here. But this basically now both Phil and Jill have access and they can sign in. And when they do sign in again, they would see this exact information or this uh, a dashboard with the same type of data in here. They would not have the Big Eco or this drop down and giving them the ability to change or see other tenants' data, obviously. Um, and I'll, I'll show you that right at the end of the demo as well, what it looks like from their perspective. But essentially, uh, Phil and Jill work for BiggieCo and they maybe want to have access um, for whatever reason. If you want to give them access to that, it's not required, um, but you know, it, is, it is possible for them to give, to give a, a specific customer or a set of customers access uh, to that. They can see or you can see uh, if there is a sensor, uh, what it is. And this is where I was mentioning earlier, it does give you the ability to kind of decorate or make minor changes to the content uh, so that if it's more helpful to you know, to know that that's in the California data center and on the first floor, uh, you can uh, you know, add any additional uh, helpful information if there is any that you want to add to there as well. Now, when it comes to reports, again, I'm looking at things from BiggieCo. If I change it to look at everything, these are all of the reports that are being run across all of my customers now uh, and have been completed. So I can see you know, when they were executed, uh, what the scope was. So when I, I'll show you in a minute how you set up a report and you can choose whether it be for all customers or just for one of your customers. And then I can always go back and uh, again, every, every report that's run shows uh, you know, the uh, content of the report. So you don't have to uh, worry that it, you know, if a report you just have being sent to a customer, uh, you, know, you don't have to also copy yourself on it. You can always go back in and uh, retrieve the contents of, the, of that report at any time if there's a question about it or, or something like that. <laughs> uh, so uh, before I go too much further, you, again, what, you, what you're able to do as both a customer who, who is kind of a, a non-read-only customer uh, or as an, an, as an MSP, I can come in and I can create or schedule a report to be run. Again, if you come back to the very beginning, what we're talking about here is the ability to keep in contact and let, you know, understand either if you're an end consumer to understand what BlueShift, uh, the service is doing for you. Uh, and you can come in and set this up so that, you know, once a week or once a month, you get a, a summary report. Uh, or as an MSP, you want to make sure, you know, you can uh, send these reports off proactively, again, to kind of help uh, everyone understand the value that they're getting to, you know, from, from the service uh, over time. So you can, uh, you know, create a new report. Again, we have uh, only a limited number of reports right now. The executive summary has a, a, su a set of high level uh, a set of information in here. And uh, I, if I set myself in context of a single customer, I have access to the risk and vulnerability summary as well. So because the risk and vulnerability summary doesn't make sense uh, you know, for an MSP across multiple customers, you have to put yourself in, in Big Eco 
or one of your customers' contacts if I want to create this for them. So if I say, you know, Big Eco um, Risk Report or something, I can run this either one time right now uh, with the last 30 days, I can do a custom range, uh, or I can schedule the report to be run you know, uh, weekly on Monday or Friday or, or monthly on the first of every month or something. And then I can put in a list of email addresses that I want to have it sent to. We didn't want to restrict it to the set of users that were set up earlier. You know, they may, you may not have given access to a particular customer uh, for, uh, you know, to sign in, but you wanted to be able to you know, put in the CEO at uh, uh, Big Eco or something. You can, so you can basically put in a comma separated list of email addresses that you see fit to have this report sent uh, and emailed off uh, to them on, on a regular basis. <clears throat> if you do one time, it'll also immediately go uh, to them as well. Uh, so if I just run this report one time and do this right now, you know, this report would get automatically generated and completed and should show up over here um, all but uh, immediately. And then, you know, you'll be able to basically get, at the moment, it's a very kind of basic report uh, that kind of talks about, you know, the, 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 the specific numbers at a given point in time. We'll continue to kind of increase the visual appeal of some of these reports. Right now, we're focused on trying to get the data out to you, uh, for you as, as fast as possible. And we'll Kind of clean these up as as time goes by. Uh, the only other thing I guess I'd show is you'll notice that when I switch back and I'm signed in as a uh, an MSP at this point, there is an additional organizations uh, 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 menu item. So organizations is essentially a list of all my customers. I talked to I can see them in this list here, including myself. But here is the essentially the list of my customers. The, uh, uh, and uh, again, these were pre-set up by BlueShift, so you don't have to do anything in here. But if you wanted to come in and put some more details around the address and primary contacts, since you may know the customer better, uh, you can feel free to, to, to come in and edit or modify these information. You can't delete a customer and you can't add a customer as an MSP, but you are able to uh, modify some of these uh, set of pieces of data uh, that you uh, on here, since uh, you may be more familiar with that set of information. Okay, uh, so that's, uh, I guess, uh, it in a nutshell. I did promise that uh, as I got to the end of this that I would show you here now, I'm signing in. Uh, let's see, I, I if I put myself in context of Big Eco, uh, I'm now looking at things as Big Eco would see, and if you, you'll notice that uh, I'm signed in on a, as a different on a different browser here, but I'm signed in as Phil from Big Eco. So uh, just to give you an idea of what this looks like, I'm in the light theme here. You know, we have a light theme and a dark theme. Just to contrast, I showed uh, you know what the difference was here, but you can see that I'm seeing the same information. Uh, but I have a different, you know, I have that whittled down list of menu items and things that I'm allowed to do and see. Uh, again, if I'm given non-read-only access, I'm able to generate a report, but it's only for myself. It's, and this is only going to be data for my particular, you know, for my, my own environment, not, I don't have access or visibility in, into others. And that's, that's really how, uh, you know, all the pieces fit together here. So this would be exactly as a customer, you know, and, and you as an end user would be able to come in and, and have the same visibility to the data, um, uh, but just for your own, uh, for your own specific environment. All right. Uh, so I think that's kind of probably a good overview of the whole thing. I'll, uh, I'm going to stop sharing so I can uh, see if there's any questions or answers in here. Otherwise, Rob, or in the meantime, Rob, I'll, I'll toss it back to you. Uh, if okay. there's any q you want to bring up. Yeah, uh, so um, unfortunately the chat uh, was disabled for this Zoom. So if you're having trouble using chat, uh, don't be alarmed. You can still send in your any questions you have via the Q&A feature. Um, if you're having trouble accessing the Q&A feature, you can just raise your hand and I'll help you. But um, Dave, there are a couple, there are two questions in the Q&A. Um, I can, actually there's a couple questions. So. Uh, first one would be, um, as a customer, could I give my MSP access to my reports? 
yes, I yes, as yes, they will see anything that the customer sets up and configures would be visible by default by the uh, by the MSP. So whether the MSP created it or whether the uh, end user or customer created it, the that would uh, the MSP would be able to see both. And only the customer would be able to see uh, the reports they configured or the MSP configured for themselves. Yes. Okay. Uh, two more questions, and they're both really related. Uh, the first one is this looks different than the console that came with XDR locally. Is this new? And then, uh, sort of as a piggyback on that, is when is this service available and how can they access it? Um, I can answer sort of the second part of that. Um, this will be available in, in early August, and if you would like, uh, to, in order to get access, and we'll send out an email with this information, I'm sure as well, but if you would like access to it, you just need to email helpdesk at blueshiftcyber.com. I'll put that information in the chat, but again, um, to sort of get up and rolling on this, you'll just need to email helpdesk at blueshiftcyber.com. Um, and to answer sort of the first one, yes, this is a new feature. Um, you will report, um, and Dave, please correct me if I'm wrong here, but you will need to sort of contact us in order for us to set you up on this platform. Yes, this, uh, so it is different. I think, uh, is this new? Yes, uh, I think the, the new part is, it does look different. Uh, so what's happening is uh, only aggregated information uh, is, coming from the XD, the local XDR. So as I mentioned at the beginning, this is not a uh, forensics or detailed uh, uh, tool that uh, or have the deep meant to even have the details locally. This is available, uh, you know, out on, uh, you know, uh, on the internet uh, and uh, therefore only contains high level summary information. And again, it's, it's meant to give you, uh, you know, a view into things uh, yourselves or or if you're an MSP uh, for your customers or across your customers, just to kind of get an understanding of what's happening in there. Um, not everyone uh, wants to see or can see or uh, can make heads or tails sometimes of, of the, all the great information that was uh, that's available in the local XDR. Uh, again, you hopefully you saw that the, the types of information that's presented in here is, is uh, high enough level, but provides value as to understanding, you know, uh, what, what it is that, uh, that it's doing um, uh, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. So you can, uh, uh, you know, understand or convey that to those that are um, paying for the service. Uh, we have a, another question, which is how much is this service? And we are including this at no additional cost and uh, for all of our Blue Shift, Blue Shift XDR clients. So if you have Blue Shift XDR, um, then you are eligible for access to this uh, reporting console. And again, you'll just need to email helpdesk at blueshiftcyber.com and we can get you up and running on it and sometime in early August. Uh, another question for you, Dave, is can the data be exported externally? Uh, for custom processing, for example, an, into a spreadsheet or into a database. Uh, that's a good uh, a good feedback. We, I mean, we anticipated uh, exporting the data, and as you saw, put it in a PDF. Um, but it, uh, at the moment, no, it's not exportable. But uh, if that's a that's a good uh, good feature, I think. Um, so we'll we'll uh, put that down as an enhancement uh, that that we'll try and get in, um, and uh, let me make a note note of who asked that question so I can make sure I understand uh, maybe offline later about what the data is that they would like to see in there. Um, obviously, there's a lot of data in here and it's constantly changing. Um, so yeah, we could expose some of it to be exported. What we're maybe displaying in a in a trend graph or uh, as a as a in a in a data consumable uh, way. Okay, uh, perfect. Um, if anybody else has any questions about the management console, I will wait here just for maybe a minute or so. Please enter them into the Q and A.
Okay, so it doesn't look like we have any uh, questions. Uh, if after uh, this uh, this meeting, you have any other or webinar, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free to reach out to any of your contacts at Blue Shift, and we're happy to answer those for you. Um, so now we're going to transition over to uh, Tom Repoy from Sygent Technology. As I mentioned, Sygent is a partner of Blue Shift and offers some really world class data security. Um, technology that uh, via your agreement or your subscription with Blue Shift, you also are able to uh, implement. And uh, we actually have a pretty um, pretty great integration with Sygent as well, where the Blue Shift SOC is able to use a lot of the Sygent technologies to secure your data in, in case of a ransomware attempt or something along those lines. So I'll pass this over to Tom. And again, if you have any questions for Tom, just enter those into the Q&A and we'll get to those when he's finished. Uh, thank you, Rob, and appreciate everybody joining today and the time that we have, and thank you for the partnership with Blue Shift. So I'm just going to jump right in to give a one-slide overview of SciGent and what we do, um, and then I'll go right into a demo. So SciGent, uh, we're a cybersecurity company focused 100% on securing data. Uh, we focus on getting down as close to your data as possible, which is with the actual individual files or down into the storage level. Uh, we come out of the data recovery industry. We've been working on data recovery off of storage media and getting files off of encrypted drives and things like that for uh, several decades. And we created this technology really to be a full comprehensive solution to protect data on endpoints, in clouds, wherever the data goes, whether it's emailed to folks and um, you know, stored a USB drive or whatever. And so we have a pretty robust set of uh, features and capabilities that start with file encryption, uh, secure file sharing, so you can share files with just the people that you want the files to be shared to. We also have the capability called Zero Trust File Access, which is essentially MFA at the file level uh, that stops ransomware attempts, it stops data exfiltration. Uh, and then we have other capabilities such as our Keep Alive Heartbeat that stops an adversary from trying to disable our services. The thing that I'm most excited about in partnering uh, with Blue Shift is the ability for uh, Greg Skazny and the SOC team to be able to protect data in the, uh, in the situation where that they see that there's an imminent attack or a potential attack on your organization by enabling zero trust file access on files that need to be protected. And so I'm gonna start by walking through a quick demo of the zero trust file access and then showing how his team has it automated and built into the, the platform to automatically implement that zero trust file access on key files when there's an attack going on on your organization. So I'll go ahead and stop sharing here and go into the demo portion. So uh, I'm gonna show here what you can see I'll start off with just zero trust file access. You can understand what it is, and then I'll show how Greg and his team use it within um, your organizations if you desire to do so. So this is a file that we have protected and it is protected all the time, this particular file by zero trust file access. And what zero trust file access means is really, like I said earlier, it's MFA for the file itself. So when I wanna go access a file, I have this little pop-up that pops up. And as soon as I, I authenticate with whatever authentication method that I've chosen, it will allow me to access that file. Uh, we have several different uh, options for authentication that you can see here. Um, you could do something as simple as a pin. Uh, you could use some of the authenticator apps that are out there for your six digit uh, code when you wanna go access it. You can also just use fingerprint on your laptop or facial recognition with your camera. Uh, you can see Duo, which is what I was showing there, which I love because it just little, puts a little pop up on my watch and I can just hit approve. Or you can use a CAC PIV or you have a key or something like that. And so that's how it works. It's pretty simple, um, but it's very powerful. So what you can see is that file that I just opened up is actually still open right now. And what would happen is an adversary might be on your system and you might be trying to steal a file. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna probably use another process. They're gonna use a process like maybe command or maybe use PS exec, or maybe they have some other kind of malware that they're gonna go to. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna try to copy it. They're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna copy this file off of the system to you know, a remote location or something like that. And when they try to do that, it blocks that access because you have to authenticate. And of course, you're not gonna to authenticate to approve some random app, you know, app trying to steal your files and it blocks that attempt and that attack. It also blocks that actual encryption attempt. So um, if somebody is on the system and you, know, you click on the wrong thing, maybe you click on ransomware without knowing it, or maybe you, um, you know, the bad guy has been on your system for a while, stolen all your files, and he's ready to do that encryption and then request your Bitcoin. He's going to run something like this, which is a zero-day 
uh, ransomware that my AV did not detect at all. It just went right past it. And it's going to do that same thing where it's going to try to access that file. And that file cannot be accessed because I am not going to allow a bad guy where to try to steal my files. So that's what our zero trust file access is. Um, and so the way that we deploy it when we work um, with organizations like BlueShift is that we'll set up all of the uh, files that we think are most important. And we won't require that zero trust file access all the time. Um, you can actually just go in here and say, okay, I want to access this um, brochure or this data sheet or document or whatever it is. And there's no need to be able to authenticate to access it. You just double click on it and you can be able to see it. And then when there's a security incident involved, Greg and his team are able to go into the management console and to be able to level up the access for those files during a, a security event. And they can do it by simply going in here to, and you can see the file just opened up right there without any kind of MFA required. And uh, Greg and his team are able to go do it manually. They actually have automated it as well, so they don't always do it manually. But um, all they have to do is go in there and from this management console remotely, they can issue a lock command either manually or automatically as part of the, what we call SOAR. So it's the security orchestration and automated response is set up to be able to automatically issue that locking mechanism on those files uh, when there's an event going on in your system. And so you can see here that the software there has um, gone crimson red and my little icon there. And now if I try to access any of these files here, I'm gonna require uh, MFA to be able to access it because I'm in that heightened threat state. Now, one thing that's super important to us is we don't want to stop your users from being able to work. If the user really needs to get access to that file because they're in the middle of, you know, presenting for a customer or, you know, working on a project, they can still get access to it themselves, but the adversary would be blocked from being able to get access to that file. And then as soon as the uh, incident that Greg and his team are working on has been uh, resolved or remediated, they'll go ahead and issue a um, a command here to be able to remotely ensure that your system is back to normal state. And you can watch this little crimson red icon go back to a normal state. And then the user can go about uh, doing their job and working. So that's our uh, uh, zero trust file access. And we have it in that kind of always on or that risk-based state. The next thing I wanna show is, is the ability to encrypt documents. So a lot of times customers want to be able to protect their documents when they're stored in the cloud. And we hear time and time again that customers are really concerned with being able to store all their files in their cloud inside of their OneDrive or in their box or Dropbox because those files are not encrypted. And they're concerned that an adversary might get access to their cloud and steal their files and be able to access them all. And so we have a simple thing that we do where we can just provide a simple file level encryption like you can see. So this file here has a .d3e on it. So that means that that file is encrypted. Um, there's no impact to the user. The user can still access that file and use it normally, but it is encrypted. So if it gets shared and put into OneDrive or it gets copied to another location, uh, that file is encrypted and cannot be accessed except by the trusted user uh, using our software and being able to be connected to our, um, our management console to be able to decrypt that file. Uh, the other thing that we do to go to the next step is to be able to say, there may be a time where I want to share this file with someone else and only the trusted person on the other side that I want to be able to have access to it. So we've created this ability we call secure file sharing. And it's as simple as this. I'm able to go in here to this file and say, okay, who should have access to this file? So you can see that I have access to this file. I've added a subscription key to it as well. So everybody at SciGent can get access to this file. That's optional, it's not required. So if I don't want everybody in my company to see the file, that's fine. Um, but in this case, I do, because this is the file I wanna share with people. And I have a partner outside of my organization that I wanna be able to have access to that file so that they can work with me collaboratively on this product and on this document. And so I've added those users. It's easy to add users, remove users. And then now I can send that document to someone. I can put it on a OneDrive share folder and that uh, person on the other end can be able to access the file. Uh, there's two ways that that person can access the file. Uh, they can first, if they want to, just go ahead and get a subscription to SciGent. Uh, where they're able to be able to have our software on the system and be able to uh, easily access it. The other way is that they can go into a simple management console like this and they can add and up upload their files here from the system and be able to 
have those files decrypted right here within this um, browser experience. And the file never leaves the browser, it never leaves the endpoint, and it's, but it's decrypted here locally um, simply by um, dragging and dropping it in here and having it decrypt and then they can work on the document there. Um, so those are the main things. I'll show one last final thing and then I'll uh, open it up for questions. Uh, we do have some special capabilities if your system has a self-encrypting drive that supports TCG Opal. Um, and what we do is we create a portion of the drive that's completely hidden and invisible to the operating system uh, that can only be accessed by using a trusted user by clicking on here and doing MFA to be able to unlock that portion of the drive. And so it's a simple thing, just like you saw me do with the other MFA capabilities for the file access, where it will pop up an alert with MFA, and I'm able to have MFA uh, unlock that portion of the drive to be able to access any of these files that are here that are completely hidden away. So you can see the benefit and the value of that, where that portion of the drive was completely hidden away from the operating system in a very, very secure place that obviously nobody could steal or ransom because they can't even see uh, that that portion of the drive is there. So with that, I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to Rob to see if there's any questions from anybody um, in the audience. All right, we do have uh, one question. And again, um, if you have any questions for Tom, just please enter those into the uh, MFA, or excuse me, into the, the Q&A, not the MFA. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got a long one here. Um, this question for Tom is, how does sidejam protection distinguish malicious, malicious encryption, uh, for example, malware and ransomware, versus allowing authorized encryption, you know, from something like backups, emails, et cetera? Uh, for example, to prevent false positives and or reduce configuration and IT management requirements, um, is this uh, protection policy-based, detection-based, and or whitelist, blacklist-based? So let, let's, let's address there, uh, Tom. A simple question, yes. So I think the shortest way to answer that is that we do have the ability to create safe apps where you can go into here and you can whitelist certain apps that would need to be able to have access uh, to uh, your data if that's a situation that you're working on. So there's all sorts of policies and everything in here you're talking about as well in your question. Um, but one of those, as I mentioned, is the ability to have a safe listed white app or white listed safe app, which would be able to get full access to your data in the case that it needs to be. Um, and that's what you would do for your backups. Uh, we actually also do that with OneDrive and Dropbox where um, you can go in there and set that um, you know, OneDrive, for example, is a whitelisted app so that when OneDrive tries to sync your files up to the cloud that they can, uh, but you can disable that for, you know, if you're not using OneDrive, you're not using Dropbox, you're not using uh, Google Drive. So hopefully that answers that question. And you asked about policies. So yes, there's lots of options here where you can set different policies and you can push those down um, to individual users or groups of users based on um, how you want to deploy it. So here's, by the way, the safe app list here. Uh, we do have some of them that are set by default. You can see some of those big cloud um, service providers, um, as well as you know, Sophos or whatever you need to be able to add. Uh, another question is, uh, how much is the Sigen Plus service? Um, I would uh, turn you over to Ted and the sales team there at BlueShift to be able to work with you guys on the pricing. Uh, we have a really great opportunity through BlueShift where they can offer SciGen Plus as a managed security provider solution, which is great. So it doesn't only come with the SciGen software, um, but it also comes with the management through the SOC where they can do uh, management on top of SciGen Plus. You get all the features of SciGen Plus as well as the management um, through the SOC. Okay, uh, one other question, and again, if there are any more, uh, please enter those into the Q&A. Um, this question is, will this product, meaning uh, the side joint uh, product that you're demoing for us, uh, will this product need an agent to run? It does use a Windows agent on the system to run, so yes. Okay. All right, we'll just hang out here for a minute to see if anybody has any final questions for Tom. <clears throat> Uh, so I guess as a follow up on that one, so uh, will this product only work on Windows or is it um, able to run on other operating systems? Uh, it's currently only designed for Windows. We do have plans to develop it for Mac and for Linux over time, but right now it's a Windows only solution, but it works with all versions of Windows all the way back to Windows 7 to 11.
All right, I think that's all the questions. Uh, so Tom, thank you for sharing this. And as Tom mentioned, um, via Blue Shift, um, you know, we are able to deliver a managed version of the SciGen um, solution. So if you are interested in learning more about that, um, you can reach out to Ted or uh, David here at Blue Shift, and we'd be happy to provide you some more information on that. Um, if anybody has any final questions, please enter those in. I'm not seeing any, any others. Um, so thank you all for attending. Um, as mentioned, if you are interested, um, here's a well, one final question. Um, yes, uh, the question is, will, you, will uh, we send out a link to the recording? Yes, after, um, after this uh, webinar wraps up, you will get an email with a link to the recording. Um, we'll also post it um, on our website as well, um, in case you wanna share it with anybody who is not able to attend today. Um, so this, uh, this wraps up today's webinar. Um, as mentioned before, if you would like to sign up um, to um, add the Blue Shift Management Console to your um, to your XDR services, all you need to do is email helpdesk at blueshiftcyber.com. And again, I'll type that again in the chat. And um, the email us will get you uh, in the queue, and um, you know we'll be ready to launch this. As I mentioned earlier, in the beginning of August. All right. Uh, looks like that's it. Thank you, everybody, uh, for joining us today and have a good rest of your day.